Think Forward. Think Research Channel. The opinions expressed in the following program are strictly those of the speaker. They do not necessarily reflect the views of the National Science Foundation. From the National Science Foundation, where discoveries begin, this is Frontier, discussions of today's most exciting research subjects by distinguished scientists and engineers working at the frontiers of knowledge. Well, it's really delightful to see you all here, and I appreciate your spending a bit of time with me to share this work that we've been doing now for 10 years um, about the American public's perspective on, obviously, a set of very important issues. Let me begin with a few quotes from people who have observed the American public's views on this issue. First, the Boston Globe said not too long ago, the ignorance of the American public about global warming stands as an indictment of the U.S. media. Interesting, okay. Here's a second one from Jeremy Rifkin. When our neighbors around the world ask why the American public was so unwilling to make global warming a priority by signing on to the Kyoto Treaty on climate change, what do we tell them? So the implicit message there is the American public does not make this issue a priority. A third one from the Cato Institute. The American public evinces such little concern about global warming. Or another one from the Pew Center, focused on global climate change. The public has not really understood the issue of climate change very well, nor have they understood the role they play in greenhouse gas emissions. We need a major effort to educate the public. Or Grist Magazine. How can we shrink, sh shrink the gap between what science tells us about the dangers of climate change and the relative disengagement of the American public? How can we get the public fired up and thus spur more aggressive policy responses? So you can see there are lots of observers who share a couple of basic assumptions. One is the public is clueless about this problem. And secondly, that they're not concerned about it. If only they were better informed, they would be more concerned and that concern would create pressure on policymakers to take steps. So then the question is, why doesn't the public get it? What's the problem here exactly? And that will be our focus today. So let me give you an outline of what we're going to talk about. We'll begin by talking about public opinion as of mid-1997, when we first started doing national surveys in this area. And we will talk about the impact of the fall 1997 debate on public opinion, and just as a, a little preview what that you might remember the fall of 1997 was the run-up to the Kyoto Treaty signing in Japan and there was in fact a huge debate in the US as we'll talk about and we were fortunate enough to be able to study the impact of that debate on public thinking um, then at, we will move on to looking at what has happened to public opinion since 1998 and finally we'll talk about the prospects for the public to get activated in the future so let's begin with this lucky opportunity one day I was uh, driving in a rental car in Columbus, Ohio on the way to play drums at a gig with my jazz group and heard on the radio the announcement that the White House was planning to hold a big conference in October of 1997 to be called the White House Conference on Global Climate Change to make the public aware, more so than it had been, of the issue of global warming and to activate a discussion of that issue during the fall running up to the Kyoto Treaty signing in Japan in December. And as a social scientist in July, the exciting thing about that was very rarely do we get advance warning of some big thing happening. And here was the opportunity. So I got on the phone and called NSF and said, you know, this is going to happen. Is there any possibility we could get some funding to do a survey before it happens? and then to do a follow-up survey after it happens and measure the impact of this debate. And happily, the answer was yes. And furthermore, happily, the, this was possible because we had done some prior work. We had questionnaires in place. We had done regional surveys in Ohio. So we didn't have to build this all from scratch in a month. But fortunately, we were equipped and able to do it. And so what I want to do is to tell you about how this all went. So just to, to refresh your memories, on October 6th, of 1997, the White House conference occurred. It was a day-long conference on television from gavel to gavel, so to speak. Uh, it featured all of the top cabinet members sitting 
in the White House uh, at the time that the presentations went on, both from Pre President Clinton, Vice President Gore, and lots of scientists, I'm sure many NSF-funded scientists participated in this, uh, lots of beautiful graphics, and an extensive review of the scientific evidence on climate change and its dangers at that time. And what's exciting for us is that it stimulated a tremendous public response. There were literally hundreds of newspaper stories, editorials, letters to the editor, talk radio programs, internet sites created, advertisements taken, full page ads in the New York Times. All of this kicked off as a result of this conference. And in these various fora, you saw opinions expressed on this issue by scientists, environmental groups, politicians from the US and other countries, people from industry, ordinary citizens. And the climax of all this was the Kyoto Conference in December. So at the time, I was at Ohio State University, and we did two surveys through the Ohio State Survey Research Center. The first one involved interviewing between September 1st and October 5th, uh, a, a representative national sample of people interviewed by telephone. Um, and then we re-interviewed those same people as well as a completely fresh cross-section of individuals between December 20th and February 13th. So this was running right up to the day before the White House conference, and this was beginning after the Kyoto Treaty signing. So, uh, the, let me, just a very quick word about methodology. I can tell you I am obsessed with survey methods. I spend my life worrying about small details to be sure that surveys are accurate and unbiased. And so you can take my word for that as a summary, and I'll tell you some of the specifics. The Ohio State Survey Research Unit did the data collection. This was computer-assisted telephone interviewing, meaning that the interviewers spoke to respondents by telephone but looked at computer screens that presented the questions to them and allowed them to record answers by pressing buttons on the keyboard. We used random digit dialing, which means we were able to reach listed as well as unlisted households. Um, and we used balanced question wordings. In the slides you will see the question wordings don't look balanced because I'm trying to present them quickly and easily for you to digest. But the, each question presented all points of view equally prominently. And we also rotated the order of response choices. Excuse me, we, we took into account the fact that response choice order matters. Let me tell you very briefly, this is one of my favorite topics. If I ask you a question, a multiple choice question and give you some options to answer, you will be inclined to select the first answer choice if you read the options, but you will be inclined to select the last answer choice if you hear the options. Because this was done by telephone and because we already had a sense of the way the results might go, we actually set up the order to bias our findings against the conclusions that you will see are supported by the data. So this is, in some sense, despite that, that leaning. Uh, the interviews were 40 minutes long, uh, which means we measured a lot of beliefs and attitudes and behavioral inclinations. OK, so what did we see in September, October 1997? Was it the case that, at that point, the American public was as clueless as so many quotes have suggested? Here's the first finding. Has global warming been happening? And let me uh, just tell you, this is, a, again, it's a sort of a quick presentation of the way the question was worded. But we asked people in a much more gradual and scientifically accurate way about the Earth's temperature heating up gradually over a period of 100 years. And what you can see here is that 78% of Americans at that time said they thought global warming had been happening. OK. Secondly, will the Earth's temperature continue to heat up in the future if nothing is done to prevent it? 74% of Americans said, yes, they thought that would occur. Next, overall, for people, will global warming be good, bad, or neither good nor bad? And here you have 63% of Americans saying they thought it would be bad. Um, interesting, 15% of folks saying they thought it would be good. Maybe those are the folks in Minnesota who would like to be able to have a beach nearby. Um, <laughs> When we asked people, what effects do you think global warming might have? 69% said they thought it would cause more storms. 58% said they thought it would reduce food supplies. 52% said they thought it would cause more water shortages. 51% said they thought it would cause sea levels to rise, animal species to become extinct, and 50% at plant species becoming extinct. So many of these are, are the kinds of effects that the scientific community has been telling the public are likely to follow from climate change. And in fact, the public, in a majority or a large majority, saw these to be true. Here's a particularly interesting set of findings. 
Uh, the tall bars here are the proportion of Americans who said that they thought a great deal should be done to combat global warming, or quite a bit. Those are the top two points on a five-point rating scale. And so you see 59% saying the US government should do a large amount, 58% saying so about foreign governments, 59% saying so about US businesses, and 43% about average people. They weren't quite as uh, prepared themselves to take action, <laughs> relied on their leaders instead. Uh, but the really remarkable finding here is when we ask people how much effort did they think these various groups were devoting to the problem. These little tiny bars down here show you that whereas 59% of people wanted either a great deal or quite a bit done, only 10% thought that much was being done uh, by the US government, 4% thought so by foreign governments, 7% by US businesses, and 5% by the American people. So there's a big gap here between how much effort people would like to have seen devoted and how much effort was being devoted. Now what about solutions? We asked people whether they thought Reducing air pollution would or would not reduce future global warming. Now, I know there are people in this room who would say, well, of course, air pollution will not reduce global warming because our air pollution is about particulate matter and global warming is about greenhouse gases. As it turns out, in extensive pretesting work and focus groups we did, we learned that the American public does not distinguish greenhouse gases as a separate category from air pollution. And at that time, the term greenhouse gases was not as widely understood. So this really captured the concept well. And 80% of Americans believe that this would be an effective way to reduce future climate change. 91% of Americans, 91% believed that the US government should limit air pollution by US businesses in order to address this problem. And 71% believed that the US government should withhold foreign aid from other nations that fail to reduce their own air pollution emissions. So lots of agreement on those strategies. So if we just stop there for a moment, according to these measures, large majorities of Americans got it. Right? They were sort of on the right page. And it, it, you can't expect much more than that for a conventional issue in public debate. So then what happened with the White House conference and the fall debate? What did that do to all of this? Well, it might have increased Americans' attention to the issue, might have changed their beliefs, might have changed their preferences. Let's start with attention, first of all. Did anybody notice this? Did they pay more attention to the issue? Well, there was, in fact, uh, more public attention. The right-hand bars here show that people reported more exposure to stories about global warming either in the newspaper or on television in the December-February survey as compared to the uh, September-October survey. A bigger increase on television than in newspapers. People also reported thinking more about the issue. We asked them, how much have you been thinking about it? And they reported more thinking in the December through February survey than they had previously. And here's my favorite measure. This is a measure of reaction time. Psychologists for decades have been measuring reaction time in laboratories. And recently we've come to realize we can do this in telephone surveys as well. If an interviewer reads you a question over the telephone, the interviewer can immediately push a button on the computer so that the computer's clock time gets recorded. And then the instant you begin to answer the question, the interviewer can push a button again and record the clock time again. That gap in time is what we think of as response latency. It's how long it took you to generate your answer and begin reporting it. And it turns out that as you can see in December and February, people were notably quicker from 3.3 seconds down to 2.9 seconds in order to report whether they thought global warming would be good, bad, or neither good nor bad. And it turns out that this reaction time is an indication of opinion crystallization. If you can report your opinion quickly, that's a solid, strong attitude that's likely to direct your behavior and it's likely to be the result of considerable thought. So here we're not relying on people's self-reports about their, uh, the strength of their opinions. We're actually measuring it more directly. Okay, so people were paying more attention. They got exposed to information. Did their beliefs or attitudes change? And the answer is, stunningly, not even slightly. So you, these, there are lots of numbers on this page. If you look at the, uh, on the surface here, comparing these, these are the September to uh, October numbers I've already shown you. These are the answers to the same questions in December through February. And if you just look across in each row, there's really nothing moving on that surface. So 
America can be obsessed with an issue. There can be elaborate debate about that issue in the ideal vision of democracy. And yet, nothing happens? Well, it turns out, no, it isn't quite true that nothing happens. Beneath this calm surface, there was movement. And it's interesting movement. It's a growing partisan division. And let me illustrate how this happened. As you can see on, here are some different examples. As you can see on the left-hand side, this is the question about whether U.S. government should limit uh, air pollution by U.S. businesses. So you can see that Democrats and Republicans, even strong Democrats and strong Republicans, huge majorities agreed that this ought to be done by government. But notice what happened in December and February. The Democrats moved in the direction of the White House position, while the Republicans moved away from the White House position. And this is a, 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 an illustration of what we think of as Q-driven, expert-driven attitude change, consistent with quite a bit of research in political science, where when Americans are forming or changing opinions, they look to elites they trust. And one of the things I haven't told you is that during the fall of 1997, there was a clear bifurcation of messages in the public debate. There was, on the one hand, the, uh, a set of views espoused quite prominently by the Clinton White House that global warming had been happening, was a problem, deserved attention. But at the same time, those full-page ads in the New York Times were often placed by more Republican sources who expressed skepticism about this problem. So what you can see is that individual members of the public moving in the direction of elites they trust. Here's another way in which this happened. Here's the question about how much effort the government should devote to this problem. In this particular case, you'll see the Democrats stayed about constant, but the Republicans dropped considerably in the amount of effort they felt that the government should devote to the problem during this time period. And a third example of how this could happen is the case of whether global warming had been occurring or not, where the Republicans stayed about constant, but the Democrats moved in the direction of the White House. So there was not a single s pattern of one group moving, the other not. But in every case, what we saw was this growing partisan division. We started off with relative unanimity, and we moved toward dissent and disagreement. Okay, so we're now coming to the end of part one. Four principal findings to summarize what you've seen. Before the fall, Americans were sort of already on the right page with the scientific community. They believed global warming was real, that it would be bad for people, that governments and businesses should do a great deal to combat the problem, and that the federal government should restrict air pollution by American businesses and by foreign countries to which it gives aid. Secondly, the fall debate engaged people in thinking about the issue, and opinions became more crystallized. The overall balance of opinions didn't change, but beneath the surface, party loyalties started to create differences of opinion on this issue. Now, you might say, looking back on this, how might the Clinton White House feel about all this? I mean, if their agenda was to instigate a public debate that would move Americans in the direction of their point of view, Certainly, it didn't happen. The, the public already started off kind of on the right page. So I, uh, some years ago, in looking at these data, speculated that maybe they were acting kind of like good lawyers act, that you never ask a witness on the stand a question where you don't know what the answer is going to be in advance. And maybe it was the case that the Clinton White House had actually done surveys. Oh, this is lovely. Uh, shall we tell Microsoft or no? Uh, maybe. Um, <laughs> that maybe the Clinton White House had done surveys already and knew where the American public stood, and the goal of the fall was to make the country aware of what it itself already believed. And in fact, when I gave this talk some years later, somebody in the back said, I worked at the Clinton White House in those days, and that's exactly what happened. Um, so an interesting case of learning about politics. Okay, so what's happened to public opinion recently? And here we can use the newest survey as a part of the device. Well, it turns out, that even today the large majorities persist and in many cases have grown. So let me show you, here's a question of, uh, again about has global warming been happening? Now in 2006, that percentage is up to 85% as compared to the around 80% numbers from some years ago. So you might say, well, that's not a huge increase, but we're getting up toward the ceiling here. It's not going to get much higher than this. You know, there still are something like 7% of Americans who today say cigarette smoking is not dangerous for your health. And so it's, it's, there, there are limits to how far one can get with these numbers. Um, global warming 
will pose a serious threat to future generations, according to 80% of Americans. This is a survey done by the Public Policy Institute of California. Here is 72% uh, in a CBS New York Times survey showing, uh, the, expressing the opinion that we should take steps to counter global warming right away. When asked in our newest survey, how much should the federal government be doing now to combat this problem, 46% said much more than they are now. 22% said somewhat more. You add those together, you're up to that 68% of support. Almost nobody's saying we should be doing less than we are now. 81% of Americans favor limits on greenhouse gas emissions by large companies. An increase from 67% up to 79% of Americans saying that President Bush should develop a plan to reduce emissions of greenhouse gases. Here, actually, a slight decrease, but certainly nothing statistically significant between 2000, 2001, and 2002 in terms of the proportion of people who said they were seeing, hearing, or reading something about global warming. 58% now say they know a lot or a moderate amount about global warming. This is kind of at the high end of the rating scale. And so, at least according to this self-assessment, Americans are now considerably more knowledgeable than they were at the end of the 1990s. But it turns out, amidst all of this, the partisan division is growing. So let me illustrate this for you. So now the left-hand side here are exactly the same graphs that I showed you earlier, comparing 1997 to 1998. Here's the 2006 graph, and as you can see, the little partisan gap blue bar there is considerably bigger than it was back in 1997. So we continue to hear from elites who Americans trust a bifurcated message about this problem, and there continues to be growth in that partisan division. Nonetheless, large majorities do persist on the basics. So what's the problem? Isn't this great? Aren't we in right where we should be, according to the natural science evidence? Well, here's the problem. This is what inspires a lot of hand-wringing. When you, we asked in our survey recently, what's the biggest environmental problem facing the world? Not what's the biggest problem facing the world, but what's the biggest environmental problem facing the world? Only 16% of Americans said global warming or anything like it. And as you can see, uh, there are smaller numbers of people uh, endorsed other problems. Now, there's certainly now, global warming was number one here, but 16% is a very small proportion of Americans placing global warming at the top of their agenda. And these, you might imagine these folks who said air pollution were disguised as global warming comments. It turns out our interviewers probed them to say, well, what do you mean by air pollution? And we learned they clearly did not mean global warming. Those who were probed and said global warming got bumped up into this top category. So when you limit matters just to environmental issues, global warming is certainly not taking a huge bite of American concern. And when you ask about the seriousness of problems facing the United States, you can see 75% of Americans said Crime was an extremely or very serious problem for the U.S. 58% said so about health care. 51% about education. 43% said so about unemployment. 31% about inflation. And over here is little old global warming coming in last place in this question. And it's not that we read these choices in this order and somehow this looked less important than it, when it appeared last and when it came first. It just isn't at the top of people's agenda in terms of a competition with other problems. So why might this be? Well, one speculation some people have offered is, well, the problem is it's really way far off. Like, in fact, none of us alive today are really going to suffer the way future generations will. And in fact, there is evidence to suggest that personal relevance, Americans' perception that they themselves will be affected by the problem, has been dropping over time. Um, it's also related to age. So, for example, if you ask people, will global warming pose a serious threat to you or your way of life in your lifetime, 54% of 18 to 34-year-olds say yes, but only 28% of 55-plus-year-olds say yes. That's quite a reasonable thing to say in a sense because the planet itself is heating up gradually and the real effects will take a while to appear. On the other hand, if there are policy changes made now to alter greenhouse gas emissions, and they have substantial economic impact, either positive or negative, we're all going to feel it. And so it's quite reasonable to say, yes, even for those 55-plus-year-olds, that they can feel effects. It's just that they don't feel as implicated as 
others. But the fact is, we've done 50 years of research on this problem in political science and social psychology, and we have learned over and over again that people do not think about po politics in terms of their own personal pocketbooks. It is not the case that people say, if I will be hurt, then I worry. If I will not be hurt, then I do not worry. People think about the country and the planet at that level, at that abstract level. In fact, attributionally, they see very little link between what happens at those collective levels and what happens in their personal lives. If I lose a job, I don't blame the White House for the most part. And if I am suffering in other ways, I don't blame government for the most part. So that's not a viable explanation. But we do have an alternative account to explain why it is that concern is as low as it is. Here it is. Uh, I don't expect you to read this. Um, I don't have time to walk you through it. But I will tell you that right here in the middle is national seriousness. That's the judgment we care about. Why is it that that is as low as it is? And what follows from that? So we have a series of causes and a series of consequences. And I'm going to make this really simple for you to see here in this picture. The argument that we make with what's called the ACE model is that judgments of national seriousness, not just about global warming, but about any problem, are a function of five considerations. First of all, you have to believe the problem exists in order to be concerned about it. And there are some people, as you saw, not many, but there are some people who don't even think the planet has been heating up or will heat up in the future. So clearly, they're not going to say it's a serious problem. Secondly, in order to call it a serious problem, it's got to be bad. And so, as you saw, there is a large majority of Americans who think it's bad that the planet is heating up, but there are others who don't think so. Thirdly, you've got to be certain of those views. Forty years of research in social psychology shows that you can believe something exists and it'll be bad, but you can also hold those beliefs with very low certainty. And if you are uncertain, you will hold back. You will not become passionate, involved, activist, pressuring, and so on. And in the case of environmental issues, we've learned repeatedly now by studying many different kinds of environmental issues that people view environmental problems as in two categories. Those that happen naturally without human involvement and those that are provoked by human action. And when nature is doing its own business, Americans don't call that a problem nearly as often as if they believe humans have distorted nature somehow. And so in order to get judgments of seriousness, people have to believe humans are responsible for this planet warming. And lastly, this is a quite an interesting one. According to work that goes back to the 1970s and the very first Earth Day, actually, that was an inspiration for this work, it appears that Americans are not willing to acknowledge that something's a problem if they don't think they can fix it. It's too upsetting to say something's a problem if we don't have a solution in hand already. And it turns out, as you'll see, the, the three elements I haven't shown you yet are the problems. So the first one is certainty. When we asked people how certain are your views about the existence and consequences of global warming, what we found was that only 7% are in the top category, extremely sure, and only 25% are very sure. The, you have to move people up to those levels in order for them to become really deeply concerned. And as you can see, there's much more uncertainty at those lower levels. And we found, through analysis of these data, that there are three attributes that increase people's confidence in these beliefs considerably. The first is they've got to trust the scientific community. And I will tell you, when I started this work, I thought, trust the scientific community? What's not to trust about the scientific community? And it turns out uh, that there are a remarkably large number of Americans who believe in the scientific community to be producing objective, valuable, and accurate information. But there's another chunk of people who are quite skeptical. In fact, when we did focus groups around the country, we heard people say, ah, scientists are just like everybody else. They're bought and paid for. Whoever pays their salary determines what results they're going to get. OK. So the more people trust scientists to be accurate, the more certain they are in their views of this issue. Secondly, people who are highly educated, apparently, we have, we have not gone into depth on this, but my speculation is that these folks are better able to read and understand the technical discussions that have made their way into the media. And lastly, Americans need to believe that the scientific community has reached a consensus on these issues. Now, for those of you who are knowledgeable about the natural science side, 
you know that there are very, very few issues in the, the last 100 years where the scientific community has been both so unified and so publicly unified as they are on this issue. The International Panel, let's see, I'll get this wrong, the IPCC, somebody knows what that stands for, um, is, uh, is it the International Panel on Climate Change or something? Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, has issued a series of reports uh, back into the 1990s saying over and over and over again that the scientific community from many, many nations believes the, all the things that the majority of Americans have said they believe here. But you may know also there's been a very interesting trend in the American news media on this issue, such that there has been a balance to stories. Whenever there's a, a, the latest story saying the scientific community has the latest study showing climate's heating up, here are the consequences, at the end, there are typically comments from skeptical scientists as well. And this is, uh, it was in fact, uh, sorry, it, the basis of a, uh, an art, a wonderful article called Balance as Bias, written by a couple of analysts at uh, the University of California, Santa Cruz, I think, uh, in which they did a content analysis of news media stories and quotes in them, showing how balanced that news media coverage is. And I was at a very interesting conference in Aspen, Colorado in the fall, at which I was in a small working group with the head environmental reporters for the New York Times and Time Magazine and uh, the New Yorker Magazine and National Public Radio and other major outlets that ended up being sort of a mutual support session for those folks who said it drives us crazy. Here's what happens. We talk to experts who are credible. We know that they're credible. We write a story that focuses on that expertise and the next day my editor calls me screaming that he got an angry phone call from somebody saying how could you write this story in such an unbalanced way and fail to give voice to the alternative perspective such that the reporters now feel such pressure that it's essential, they think, in order to present a, a balanced story that they find a few individuals who will be quoted. And those who work in that area say there's a list of about five people who they rely on <laughs> over and over again who are willing to be skeptical about just about any climate change claim. So what does that do? Well, it turns out there's a few things. First of all, when we look at the distribution of trust in scientists in our data on the issue of global warming, You'll see only 5% of Americans say they trust the scientific community completely. 27% said they trusted a lot. 41% said they trusted a moderate amount. You know, luckily only 5% is down at the bottom. But still, there's plenty of room for improving trust in the scientific community on this issue. But look at this. Only 35% of Americans in our survey most recently said that most scientists, experts in climate, agree about the existence and consequences of global warming. Whereas 64% of Americans says they, they think in, instead there's a great deal of disagreement in the scientific community. And that, in fact, is tied to media exposure. The more people are exposed to the news media coverage, the more they perceive the scientific community to be divided, and that then decreases trust and certainty. Um, just so you can see the trend over time, there's really been absolutely no movement since 1997 in the proportion of Americans who think that most scientists agree on this issue that division has remained. Here's the last barrier, uh, well, there's a penultimate barrier, I should say. This is beliefs about human responsibility. 31% of Americans believe that the world's heating up is mostly caused by the behavior of people. 49% say people and nature play equal roles in the process, and only 19% say that it's mostly nature. So again, this relatively small percentage in this top category is another barrier to public concern. They say, well, nature's doing it. We were doing it a little bit, but nature's doing this as well. So let me show you how these various ingredients combine together. So at the top here, these are people who say global warming definitely is not happening. They say it's not happening, and they're certain of that. Their national seriousness rating is about as low as you can get on a scale from 0 to 100. It's, it's at 11. You might say, well, is it, why is it not at 0? Uh, and you know, that's an interesting question, but it's not quite all the way down there. Uh, these are people who say it doesn't exist, but I'm not completely sure. It probably doesn't exist. Well, they're, they're not quite as low on this concern level. It might exist, and I guess if it did, that would be a problem. These are people who believe global warming does exist, but that it would actually be either good or neutral for people. They're at 39. People who believe that global warming exists will be bad for people, but they're uncertain of this are at 44. If you then move them into the high certainty category, they move up to 60. And if you now add together all five considerations, global warming exists, it will be bad for people, they are certain of this, it's 
caused by humans and it can be solved, that gets them up to 63%. Now, it's not all the way to 100, but it gives you a feel for how these various considerations combine together to increase concern. Okay, so what are the implications? Well, if somebody is concerned, uh, would like to see the American public more concerned about this problem, then they've got to convince more people that it exists, they've got to convince more people that it will be damaging, they've got to increase that certainty, they've got to increase perceptions of human responsibility for what's happened, and they've got to convince people of, of effective solutions. And my take is, this is the big problem. The fact is, so far, we have heard lots and lots of talk about reducing future greenhouse gas emissions. I have yet to hear anybody talk about inventing a gigantic vacuum cleaner to go up into the atmosphere and suck out the greenhouse gases that are there now. And for those from a naive perspective who say, well, aren't we all worked up about the fact that we've got a large accumulation of greenhouse gases now? What are we supposed to do about that problem? The American public is not hearing anything about that, I would suggest. And I think if the scientific community wants to activate the public, this is where the focus has to be, to help people understand what magnitude of problem we're talking about if there is no future emissions to add and how different that will be otherwise. Okay, so, you know, lots of good news, not as good as it could be, but at some level, all of what I've told you is just about irrelevant to public pressure on government. And let me tell you why that's true. Public pressure doesn't come from the general public, as I've been telling you all about so far. Public pressure on government comes from a small subset of the public that we refer to in political science as the issue public. A small group of people who are particularly passionate about this issue. These are the activists. These are the people who write letters, make phone calls, who go to protests on the mall, who spend their lives making sure government knows they want something done about a particular issue. So it's defined as the small fraction of the population who are passionate, and they are the activists. Let me give you a sense of the size of the global warming issue public now compared to other issue publics. So here's global warming. As of 2006, 17% of Americans said this issue was extremely as imp important to them personally, as important as, it, as any issue could be. And as you can see, the largest issue public that we have seen in recent years is the abortion issue public at 31%. Government services for social programs is at 21%. But lots of other issues that get lots of public debate attract real passion from considerably smaller groups. So in some sense, the issue public for global warming is already at an awfully high level. Let me give you a little sense of where these folks are. For whatever reason, the largest proportion of the issue public is, is in the Pacific region where I live. And right over here in the mountain region, that's not, I mean, it's, you can see a little bar there, but it actually is really at zero. Uh, I, we don't quite know what's happening. They're having a good time in the mountains there, and they're not paying much attention. Uh, so there is certainly some regional variation. In this group, there is nearly unanimous support for aggressive ameliorative action. And this is the real victory of the 1997 effort by the White House, that moving from 1997 to 1998, the climate change issue public increased from 8% up to 11%. Now you might say, gee, that's tiny. But the fact is, that 3% increase is millions of people who moved into a group who are activists on this issue. And as you can see, in the subsequent years, it has increased up to that 17% that I showed you earlier. So clearly, this the pressure on government is increasing. So what conclusions can we reach? Well, first of all, Americans overwhelmingly accept the scientific community's view of global warming, even though they don't recognize that the, that the scientific community is unanimous in supporting that view as well. Public passion about this issue is indeed increasing, and it's at a remarkably high level even today. The tipping point is coming. And you know what I mean by the tipping point. This is the moment at which we shift from uncertainty and skepticism to, well, of course, you know, why, why wouldn't you think climate change is happening? Of course it's an urgent problem. Let's now talk about what kinds of support we saw for ameliorative actions um, as a way of winding down to the end of this presentation. So what could be done with American popular support? What about economic incentives for consumers? You know that there's been discussion of this. 
And Americans say, no way. So for example, should we increase taxes on electricity so that people use more electricity? Or should we increase taxes on gasoline so that people use less gasoline? Very commonly discussed strategies in the city. Guess what Americans think about that? Manipulating their behavior artificially, giving them economic incentives to behave differently. 19% like the electricity tax and 31% favor the gas tax. Not very popular. So you say, okay, now we see the problem. The problem is nobody's going to be willing to endorse any solutions. Nobody's going to be willing to endure any pain. Not true. Here is an alternative set of strategies. <laughs> Require businesses or encourage businesses with tax breaks. If you ask, should American businesses either be required by law or encouraged with tax breaks to make more electricity from water, wind, or solar, 87% of Americans say yes. If you ask, should businesses been re be re required or encouraged to build more efficient cars that use less gasoline, 84% say yes. Should businesses be encouraged or required to build more efficient appliances that use less electricity, 83% say yes. Building more energy efficient buildings that keep the heating and cooling in, 84% say yes. And requiring or encouraging reduction of greenhouse gas emissions by power plants, 87% say yes. So what we see is huge majorities willing to support these strategies. Now let me tell you an important thing. Every one of these strategies will cost consumers money. The increased costs will be passed along, and we told them that in the survey. And yet, as you can see, these strategies they like. So there is promise for popular support, even for personal pocketbook contributions, if made by the right mechanism. Okay. So here's my closing slide, and this is sort of a look back at history to say, let's think about a parallel case, a very interesting parallel case, and that is the case of cigarette smoking. In 1957, 41% of Americans believed that smoking was dangerous to human health. As of 2005, 92% believe that smoking is dangerous. And if you look at the graphs, it's, it's a beautiful linear trend over that time period. Slowly, more and more and more people came to expect that point of view. What did that? What provoked the essential unanimity of the public on this? Well, there was more and more and more and more research. It has to keep on coming. Please note, National Science Foundation. <laughs> Secondly, uh, a concerted, aggressive public education campaign on every single package of cigarettes. Cigarette smokers could not pick up a pack without seeing that. Not quite sure what the equivalent is for climate change. Um, educational programs in schools, lots of them. And maybe most importantly, human drama. Whistleblowers, secret documents, lawsuits, and then eventually, by a few years ago, executives from tobacco companies on the stand in court confessing that, yes, cigarette smoking is dangerous to health, and they've known it for a long time. You now know Philip Morris, other tobacco companies, have websites saying smoking is dangerous to health, encouraging people to quit smoking, and so on. Now, there's interesting stories about where they came about, but the truth is, they're out there. That's I think, the potential future for climate change. And what I see from these data is movement of the American public in that direction. But it's just a matter of time until we get there. I've heard predictions that we should be paying attention to the White House. Soon enough, we will hear a different message from the White House about this problem. Um, that it's certainly everything I have suggested to you so far indicates that if that message were to come from the White House, the American public, even and especially majorities of Democrats would warmly embrace that message. So there's plenty of political incentive to endorse what the scientific community has been saying. Thank you very much for your time. Good afternoon, Dr. Kleffner. It's a pleasure to be with you today. I'm so glad you could come, and congratulations on your award. Thank you. Explaining the importance of science to the general public is a top priority for the National Science Foundation, and it's one of the reasons for which you earn this award, in fact. Could you tell me, how do you do this, and how can we encourage others to follow your lead? Well, I enjoy doing it. I enjoy writing about science. I've written, over the years, many short essays on science, which are, well, they're really intended for what I call the lay physicist, namely my colleagues, but they're of broader interest, and there's been a very warm response. Also, there are many opportunities for teachers to teach. I 
very often give guest lectures. I spend much of my time <coughs> with the students. And if I have any opportunity to talk with anybody about physics, I'll take it. And how does your research affect Americans? Does it have quality of life implications? It's obviously advanced the world of science. Has it advanced American competitiveness? Well, there's a very nice story there because the first subject that I really got interested in was atomic clocks. Uh, this was in the 1950s when they were just being developed. And I went to Harvard University as a graduate student and had the good fortune to start working with Norman Ramsey when he had a wonderful idea for a new type of atomic clock. Now, the reason for making the clock wasn't particularly because we were clock makers, but we wanted to make a clock which was so good that you could see the effect of gravity on time. This is one of the uh, implications of general relativity. Now, if you were to try to explain to Congress why they should support science in order to help the public, it would be very difficult to argue that you ought to study general relativity, which is about as remote from everyday life as you can think of. Nonetheless, the thought that matter affects time, that gravity affects time, was fascinating. I know this was what got me interested in this, and it also was what Norman Ramsey, my, my professor, was interested in. And we did develop a clock. It's called the hydrogen maser, which has been very useful over the years. Atomic clocks have gotten better and better, but the hydrogen maser is still being used, which is, of course, a great source of satisfaction. But what's more important is that coming out of these atomic clocks is not only the fact that general relativity has been confirmed, the effect that we were looking for, um, but that the clock itself had applications which we didn't dream about. Some of them were purely scientific. You may have heard of very long baseline radio interferometry. This is a technique in which you can essentially make a radio telescope essentially the size of the Earth. Not in its collecting power, but in its angular resolution. Turns out that that was possible because of hydrogen masers. So these have been very useful for, for radio astronomy and for understanding the universe. But what was perhaps the most familiar uh, application to develop was the development of the global positioning system. Mm. Now, this is part of our everyday life now. Certainly but, part of mine. Yes, everyone uses this. But at the heart of that system was atomic clocks. Now, the system involves much other technology. It, it involves satellites. It involves modern communication theory. They're wonders of engineering. But they would not have been possible without atomic clocks. They've had a huge impact on the economy. They have saved countless lives. They're part of our lives now. Now, this was the, one of the consequences of studying general relativity. And I think this makes a very nice uh, example of why studying basic science is really good for the country. It pays off in many ways, but you can't predict them ahead of time. You're talking <coughs> about time. Is this an important time, a particularly important time for physics today? Or for science in general today? Well, yes, certainly. We are becoming more and more aware of the challenges which face us in the future. The problems of supplying energy, of dealing with the environment, of technologies for health care, uh, technologies for developing economies so that the world can be a stable place. And science plays a very important role in all of these. We are going to depend upon science to make life decent in the future. And it's a very urgent, uh, it, it's an urgent task for us. We must sustain our scientific base and improve upon it if we can uh, in, in order to have a decent quality of life in the future. I've heard that you're involved in an exciting program, in fact, to encourage individuals to enter teaching in high school. Could yeah. you tell me about that? <clears throat> yes, th there's a desperate need for high school and, and lower grade teachers in the physical sciences. There's a, a tremendous shortage. Hardly any physics students, qualified physicists, are going into high school teaching. And this is a great shame, A, because high school teaching is a wonderful career, and B, because they're desperately needed by the country. So we've started a little project at MIT uh, in the MIT Harvard Center for Ultra-Cold Atoms. It's called TOPS, for, for Teaching it's Opportunities right in Physical Sciences. And we bring every summer eight students from around the country, eight physics majors, and they work with some high school teachers, and they actually prepare material for teaching, and they teach it to middle school te students and to high school students. 
So they have about three weeks of actual teaching preparation. And we try to tell them about the relation of what they're teaching to the research going on at the Center for Ultra-Cold Atoms. And basically, we're trying to get a few more good teachers into the system. We need huge numbers of teachers. But the underlying idea of TOPS is that a small number of really superb teachers can have a huge impact over the years. So this is the spirit of it, that we're trying to get a small number of really good teachers into the system. Is there any bit of advice you would give to students today as they look at that course selection book and they're prodding through trying to figure out their future? Is, how could you convince them to take an extra look at science? Well, one way is to look at the past. I've done this. I've gone back and looked at the Nobel Prizes in my field, atomic physics, and there have been many over the past 30 or 40 years. And increasingly um, many more from Americans. Yes. In the past for the past half century, America has really clearly led the scientific scene internationally and is still a leader. Um, but in looking at these Nobel Prizes, what struck me is the fact that although the Nobel Prize is given for the impact of work, this is how you establish its importance, what impact it's had, the actual impact, looking back years later, is much greater than anyone thought of at the time. That the, uh, that the riches which come out of these discoveries are, are unimaginable, mm -hmm. yes. And that young people starting into physics now should try to keep this perspective in mind, that when the important advances took place at the time, they grew out of kind of small beginnings. And they grow, and they grow, and they grow. And that one ought to look at the earlier history of science and see the problems that people were encountering then, and then look what came of it. And that's enough to make anyone, I think, enthusiastic and optimistic. If you could see one of the problems solved or an advancement made, where would you like more work done? Well, the problem I would like to see solved is the problem of science education in this country. We need more bright young people coming into science. The bright young people find the problems. Mm -hmm. that that's where the future lies. The predictions that I make are likely to be foolish. I've studied this. I've looked at past predictions. I've been on committees which over the years have made predictions. What's interesting, in every case, the predictions that we made fell far short of the reality. That there are what are called dec decadal surveys, which are carried out by the, uh, basically under the National Academy of Sciences, where you bring the best people together and try to decide what are the most important problems to work on. You come out with a very nice list. And then you look back and you see what really happened. And it really exceeds what was listed there. This is one of the uh, qualities of science that I particularly enjoy. In many human endeavors, things don't work out quite as well as we would like them to. You have utopian ideas and utopias don't take place. Science is the one area in which the, um, the outcome is generally far beyond what one could have predicted. So that's a very nice type of enterprise to be involved with. It is, in fact, exciting times. Mm -hmm. Dr. Kleppner, continue your good work, both in your own research and in the inspiration of others. And thank you. Congratulations. Well, thank you.